Okay. Oh, here we go. Wait a minute. All right, there we Hello, go. Hello, everyone. We are uh, on the last day of conference and our last presentation before closing. It is only fitting that the person to end our academic program on this year of legacy be John Lester. John Lester has worked with 3D virtual uh, worlds and educational communities since the 1990s, creating online patient support groups for people dealing with neurological disorders, developing immersive simulation courses for students at Harvard, and building bespoke virtual world and VR educational applications for universities and businesses. using platforms like Unity and Open Simulator to create multi-user educational experiences for both VR-based and desktop applications. He also worked at Linden Lab, known as Pathfinder Linden, where he founded Linden Lab's Boston office and led the development of the education and healthcare markets in Second Life, while evangelizing the innovative use of virtual worlds in scientific research artistic expression, and immersive learning. He currently leads virtual... Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Um, he currently leads Virtual Rehab's Global Technology Strategic Direction as their CTO, working to reduce recidivism and reincarceration rates. through VR-based immersive learning and rehabilitation programs. He also serves on the Board of Directors of Virtual Ability Incorporated, a nonprofit organization helping people with disabilities by building online communities of support using multi-user 3D online virtual world technologies. John originally studied at MIT and worked in the neurology service at Massachusetts General Hospital, where he researched neurodegenerative diseases while developing online learning and collaborative tools for physicians and patients to improve quality of life and facilitate knowledge sharing. John's neuroscience background combined with his community development and 3D virtual world experience gives him a unique perspective on how 3D virtual world and VR technology can be best matched to the human brain's natural way of learning and perceiving the world around it. Everyone, please help me welcome our special guest in keynote, John Lester, better known to many as Pathfinder. John, the floor is yours. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Check one, check two. If people can hear me, this is good. Yeah, you know, the voice has to, the, the, the voice, weird things happen with voice. Stuff happens. It's okay. We're all here. We're all here. Um, uh, again, I, I won't be hearing you guys in voice, uh, but if you have any questions, you can um, type them in chat or uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on the, the in-world chat while I'm um, going through my slides. Yes, today I'm a I'm a penguin because I just thought it would be fun and, you know, part of showing up in a, in a multi-user virtual world is actually having something kind of interesting to to see in world. I love this this little penguin avatar. I can throw fish at you guys. Let's see. Yeah, can you catch those? Oh, no, they're stopping. Okay. I can litter the stage with fish. I can throw these fish at you. Um I can fly, yes, Amberjack. I can also, I can also call my cousins. I can call a bunch of cousins here, too. Um, they're very enthusiastic. They really like me, so they they will even clap and um, follow me around. Um, 
I just love, I love this. I mean, this is part of the beauty of, of these types of environments that we're in, right? So that we can actually have um, engagement with each other and engagement with the, the spaces in here and, and, and the things in the spaces. And these little critters are following me around. <laughs> you should have been here earlier. I rezzed, I rezzed like 60 of them on the stage and the stage was just full of penguins clapping and, um, 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 c- coming after me, and yeah, they're just. I can set. I'll send them all away right now. See, I think they all fly up in the air. Like I say, penguins go home, and then goodbye. There they go. <laughs> there we go. The fish will go away eventually too. I'll stop jazzing around here in a minute. Um, and and you know, yeah, this is the title of my talk is um, is uh, let me move my camera over here because I like to see this the crowd here too oh thank you everybody for coming out here um title of my talk is beyond escapism virtual worlds vulnerable populations and 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 social good so let's just 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 dive in here and i want to have, i want to tell some stories too you don't have to look at my bio because we already saw a lot of stuff typed to you about all, all the background information um but these slides are going to these slides are available online and at the end of the slide deck i'll have a URL where you can get all these slides. That's why I put my bio on there, so you just have all the info there as well as the title of my talk. But, but you know, since this is we're talking about legacy, I, I I was looking through old images and I was like, you know, when did I start really doing some fun stuff with with online virtual worlds and and people communicating using the internet and the web? And I found this picture. This is a this is a picture of a um, sign that somebody. Um, uh, it's still up there. In, in If you go to Massachusetts General Hospital and you go to one of the physician meeting areas, this thing is still up on the wall. And it was something that I, when I was working there, it was, it was put up in 1993. And it was me basically saying, please access our World Wide Web server. I had, just, I had started you know, one of the first websites at Mass General. And we put up information about – you can see it was about um, – you know, up-to-date info on neurology and maps and mini CVs and information about staff and research labs and so forth and hyperlinks to other medical institutions and databases of interest. And what's funny to me about this is how how wrong I got it. <laughs> you know, I was I I was wrong in my mind. I I you know I look back at this and I laugh because this is you know what 24 years ago. And I was all excited about being able to connect to information. The, you know, the, the Internet would be this way of connecting people to, to, to information. And really what has most amazed me over the years is how it's really about connecting people to people, right? It's about creating, about people being able to share what they've created with other people. Um, no one in here, nowhere, nowhere on this sign does it say anything about you can talk to other people. Or, and, and ultimately, what I ended up doing at Mass General is I started working with online um, patient support communities, and I I got way more interested in that. Like, oh my, oh my goodness, I can use the web to help bring people together, and and these communities form, and they do amazing things that I never even imagined. So, um, for me, I, I I love this image because it's just again, I I, I was very wrong. Back in 1993, but I I, I learned pretty quick. I I, I learned uh, you know that uh, uh, it was all about using technology to connect people to each other, and it was really in my mind it was really about the technology um, being able to improve people's quality of life and to increase social good. You know, working at Mass General, my focus was on working with patients and caregivers and and um, and, and people with disabilities and supportive communities and and it was just amazing what happened and how um, I saw these dramatic improvements in quality of life which is which is um just kind of sad right now in terms of the industry focus on all of these um, uh, on all of these uh, oops sorry just switching screens here. Uh, all these technologies we talk about virtual worlds and 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 the industry is really focused on escapism this is a this is a image from it's uh, from someone who's drawing a picture of their how they envisioned you know the interior of that guy's van on the, in the story Red, ready player one you know and it, it's about escapism you know and and it's it's about immersing yourself in entertainment and 
and it's unfortunate because sometimes the 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 industry around VR and virtual worlds, you know, kind of they kind of pitch it as it's always a transcendent experience, and it really isn't transcendence. What they're talking about is um, is really withdrawal, you know, and and it's fine for for periods of time. It's fine to to escape once in a while. Everyone likes to do it, but but that's not the that's not the real magic thing that these platforms provide. It's not the magic thing. It's it's way beyond escapism. And um, and what I like to think about in terms of beyond escapism and virtual worlds are these three magical circles. You could call them, they're, they're kind of like verticals, they're kind of like pillars, I don't know. But I think of them as circles, and I like them as to think of them as circles because there are, are intersections between them. And the three amazing circles in virtual worlds, areas of... Of, of, of magic are uh, art, in my mind, art, education, and uh, what I like to call augmentation. And I'll explain what I mean by these three. You know, by art, it's pretty obvious. There's amazing stuff that happens in virtual environments where when artists get a hold of the tools. Because the artists are always the people who take tools for, for creating th- anything and go, I could use this tool in a totally different way. You know, oh, here's a brush that someone invented. Uh, instead of painting by, I'll maybe I'll flick the brush, and there you have, you know, you know, you have Pollock inventing his his style of of, of art. You know, at something co- totally new. So it's amazing to see what happens in the circle of art in virtual worlds because that's where people use the tools uh, in ways that the creators never expected. Um, education is the other area that I'm that I'm just very, it's just fascinating to me because, again, you know, when you're provided with these amazing new tools you can uh, the educators are the ones who figure out how to use them to create a r- immersive learning experiences so so there's amazing innovation that happens there and in terms of um, augmentation by augmentation that's really where you know you talk about um, how t- how uh, technologies like virtual worlds can be used to help people with disabilities and I, I didn't want to I don't like to think of it in terms of you know disabled people I, rather, I think about it as technology that's somehow augmenting people, right? Letting people do something they can't do in the physical world. You know, maybe like walk on a beach because they are in a wheelchair, or maybe um, you know have a have the ability to connect with lots of people around the world and 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 share experiences, but they're actually homebound in the physical world, or. Um, or, you know, a wide range of of, 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 uh, of ways of augmenting people. So I like to think of augmentation as its own magic circle. You know, the you know, virtual worlds being used to help people do things that they can't do on their own. And it's and 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 the real magic I think happens at these intersections where you have maybe something that's related to education, but also augmenting people. And also artistic expression. So think about um, think about the most amazing things you've seen in virtual worlds, and most likely it's at some kind of intersection between these three, in my opinion. Right? Some amazing learning experience that is also uh, so maybe helping people with different disabilities uh, to express themselves, and artistic expression all wrapped up in it. So it's it's um, it's kind of hard for me to talk about it because there aren't I don't think there are adequate words yet to describe all of this stuff, but uh, I did the best I could with these three circles. So, so in terms of, you know, examples of things that are happening beyond escapism in this space, and the, the first one I love to talk about is, is uh, virtual ability, where I think you can see the sign over to my, uh, where is the sign over here? Oh, there it is over there. I'm throwing fish at it. <laughs> you see me throwing fish. I don't have a pointer. I have fish to point at the sign over here, virtual ability is um, uh, you know involved in this amazing conference here, and they, there's also a um, an area I can't remember which region it's in. Maybe someone could say it in in, in local chat. But um, they have a there's a little dance area for virtual ability, and there's some there's a little display over there. But virtual ability is this amazing nonprofit organization that I've been, I've, I'm privileged to. To, to to have been and still I'm involved with to this day and it's a nonprofit organization that um, helps people with a wide range of disabilities providing supportive environments for them and uh, and and um, creative environments for them in virtual worlds their their main base of operations is here in second life but they do a lot more than just you know 
create places for people to get together and do stuff. They, they, they do amazing community events, and they, they also do amazing projects with um, uh, research organizations and government organizations, and they do consulting as well. So they, they do amazing things. And again, this is a really – this is at that intersection, in my opinion, between art, education, and augmentation. Virtual ability is right at that triumvirate intersection, you know, where you just see amazing, beautiful builds, amazing artistic expression in the space, amazing um, opportunities to help people with disabilities through augmentation of, of their creative minds – and also the education as well. And one project involved in around education and research that uh, that they that they had recently did that I love to I love to tell, talk about because I'm on the board of directors for for them and I I, I, uh, I do what I can to help them um, you know uh, think of new ways of of, of 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 helping more people. But this is something that they did uh, working with the. Um, uh, working with 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 people suffering from traumatic brain injury and post traumatic stress disorder and strokes, and so they basically created this. And when when you get a chance, watch the video. You'll be able to click on it when you look at the slides online after my talk. I don't want to play any video now or anything, but but watch the video. They created something. They built it actually an open simulator too. So they're so it's not just things happening in Second Life. In this example, it was they, it made sense to build something in open simulator because it needed to be a very closed and controlled environment. But they built this whole quest based system. To to basically have clinicians be able to walk people through uh, learning and, and, t and immersive learning exercises and, and help them, you know, guide them through a very, uh, a very defined experience and a learning experience. And it was just, it's just amazing. Watch the video. The video itself too. They did just an amazing job um, putting to the putting the, the the video together. But but this is you know this involves this involves education. This involves helping people. Who are dealing with strokes and, and traumatic brain injury and PTSD to to be able to function better in the physical world. So here are people who are they need to be augmented uh, in terms of being able to practice how to re-enter um, uh, you know daily life and do things in daily life and and, and this this environment this support space really uh, really helped them with that. Just amazing. Um, I wanted to mention too uh, Virtual Rehab, which is a uh, a small startup company that I'm involved with, um, and there the goal is immersive learning to help um, inmates uh, uh, basically re-enter society and succeed in the world. And it's the goal is to reduce uh, you know recidivism, meaning you know reincarceration, being you know committing more crimes or just being not being able to function in the physical world and be able to uh, integrate back into uh, society successfully. To be able to succeed at life, right? And and um, and this was a case where you know I do a lot of work with with virtual worlds on the desktop on on two D screens, and this is a case where um, I'm always thinking about the best tool for the the goals. And and in this in this case, immersive learning using VR was the right tool for the right job because we're we're working on developing simulations like mechanic simulations, like teaching people how to check their oil in a car. And these are these are these are systems that are being deployed, um, you know, within uh, within prison systems, within you know a, a, a prison. So you you have a uh, you know you have a system that's just it's like going to a classroom. And said you put on an HMD, you put on a head mounted display, and you have this immersive experience. And in this case, it's a really fantastic right tool for the right job because there's nothing like basically using two handheld devices to in a VR in a sort of room based VR simulation. Manipulate things under the hood of a car, and you know, pull out the. Uh, um, you can see on the right there, pulling out the, uh, the the dipstick and checking the oil. And the other wonderful thing was it it allowed us to create uh, these ex these experiential learning environments where there's basically these like quest based systems where you know you have to find the oil to replace the oil that is needed in the car, and you have to go to the store, and you have to uh, experience daily life in terms of going to the store and interacting with a cashier and finding things in you know the way stores are laid out. These are all things that for prisoners, they, they, don't, they don't have any experience like that for years when they're incarcerated, and it's a real challenge for them when they're re-entering society to, to, uh, to deal with that. So I thought you know, this is a, a really good example of the right tool for the right job. You know, VR is a really good tool. Um, uh, to create these types of simulations, both you know, kind of vocational training simulations and social simulations. You know, um, I think amazing, amazing possibilities there. 
well beyond escapism, right? This is about a life simulation, basically. So that when you're in the physical world, when you're released from prison, you know what to expect. And, it's, and really, at the end of the day, um, I think about this a lot. You know, when people talk about brand new shiny of anything, you know, here's a new shiny piece of technology. I, I'm at my heart a, a technologist, but someone who's completely people focused. You know, and 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 understanding how people interact with each other and and um, how they interact with the world and share knowledge and support. And at the end of the day. Whatever you're talking about, whatever technology you're talking about, it is not amazing if you have to explain to me why it is amazing. <laughs> and it's amazing to me how many, how much technology is people explaining why this thing is amazing, right? Um, uh, it's really uh, – if you have to explain why your thing is incredible, then you've, your thing is not incredible, <laughs> You you have to. Um, it, it should be obvious just by seeing it. Kind of you know, kind of like uh, you know, in, in Zen Buddhism, you know, this the the wordless flower sermon. You just see the flower. You see the lotus flower, and you just you can you can un, you just understand it. And and that's why I always talk a lot about stories and examples because that's how you can understand if something is really. Um, um, really uh, amazing. And yeah, like General Heron, you just said, if you have to explain the joke, it's not funny. And a lot of tech, it's amazing how much tech is explaining the joke. You know, General, I'm actually, I think I'm going to use that quote in the future because that's a really good, uh, um, it's a really good uh, way of summing it up. So on that note, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, some stories that tell more than just a story. And uh, Gentle will be familiar with these because I talked about these at a presentation I gave with virtual ability before, but I think they're, they're wonderful stories and they're not specific about, about Second Life or anything, that, uh, or anything in general other than just um, experiences that I have had, stories around experiences that I have had that illustrate the power of beyond escapism for virtual worlds. And, and virtual worlds aren't just... Um, 3D things involving putting goggles on your head. There are things like Second Life. There are 3D worlds. Are, I mean, immersive online virtual worlds are also, you know, chat rooms. There are also, um, um, uh, you know, other technologies that have come and gone in the past. Things like Active Worlds, things like the Palace, which I'm going to mention, and um, and so forth and so on. But I think these are four beautiful little stories because um, I, I like to tell stories. And again, it, they help illustrate the that magic intersection between augmentation, art, and and, and, and education. Right. So the first one I want to talk about is, is is the club. I started, when I was at Mass General, I was um, managing, I created and managed some um, some uh, real-time chat rooms because I was I was really interested in virtual worlds for patients and caregivers, and, and I started creating chat rooms to help people who were dealing with different um, neurological conditions come together and share experiences and, and and I knew I wasn't smart enough to understand exactly what they needed but I thought if I could get them together and give them the tools to talk to each other that they would come up with amazing ideas and maybe I could help them you know help them grow on their own um, once they got together and were able to share support and information and um, it's, and of course like anything else you know when you start doing this you know stuff starts happening and you don't know about it and, and it's just happening it's life it's wonderful it's like things just start growing and happening and, and at one point somebody told me they said hey John have you heard about in your multiple sclerosis chat room there's a club 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 Avenex and I'm like really club Avenex that sounds that's weird what do they do are they coming together in this club, in this chat room, and just partying? I, that sounds really weird. And and then I, it suddenly hit me. I realized um, Avonex is a drug that is uh, something that people um, with MS, uh, it's a drug that is that requires uh, self, um, uh, self-injection. You can see on the screen there, you know, you're injecting, someone's injecting themselves in their thigh with Avonex. And it's not a great experience when you're giving yourself this injection. And some people, especially people who are kind of leery of, 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 of needles, um, it's terrifying. Especially if you're somebody 
who's maybe also having to do this by themselves. Imagine being by yourself, having to do this, with no one to kind of be there for you. So what happened, completely on their own, the people who were using this multiple sclerosis chat room that I'd set up decided what we're going to do is we're going to adjust our schedules. And these were people around the world. And they adjusted their schedules so that at the same time every week, because this is like a once a week thing that they were doing, at the same time every week, they would all log into the chat room and they would all inject at the same time. They would go three, two, one, let's do it. And they would be there in real time to support each other right before the injection and right after the injection. So if someone had a tough time, people would be in the chat room talking them through it all. And this 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 blew me away. This was you know, this was um, using web based simple chat rooms. This was nineteen ninety four. And again, they coordinated this all on them all on their own. And they called themselves Club Avenex. You know, and they, they actually had set up like a web page at one point on some, you know, someone set up on their own website, a little page talking about, hey, join us in Club Avenix. And they, 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 they made it a fun experience, a supportive experience. They made it a social event all on their own. They augmented their ability to reach out across time zones and, and actually be able to um, support themselves uh, during this experience. So I, I just think uh, the club is a wonderful Amazing story. And of course, you know, that, that kind of thing happens now all the time in environments like Second Life in terms of people coordinating amazing things, you know, in, in, across the world in different, different time zones. You all kind of, some people are up late, some people are, are up early. Um, but I just thought that this was a wonderful, this is a wonderful example of that self-emergent, um, you know, intersection between, in this case, really between education and, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, improving their quality of life, augmenting themselves. Um, yeah, the club. I'm going to summarize the lessons, I think, from these stories at the end, too. So and it, I'm not just going to be rambling too much, hopefully. <laughs> um, the guy from NYC. So this is a, this is a, um, I had another uh, online community where it was, fo the focus was on Parkinson's disease. And uh, people dealing with Parkinson's disease would share information and support. And, and Parkinson's is one of those situations where we're, you're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and immediately, every, you know, understandably, you want to know all about it. And you want to know more than just what your physician is giving you in terms of information. You want to know other people who are dealing with this condition um, over years and years and how, you know, uh, how, 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 how. Um, what do you do? You know, how do you deal with that in, uh, just emotionally over time? And in one of these environments, there was a guy. Uh, his, his his username was Mike NYC, and Mike NYC would never talk at all about who he really was. He would just be like, "I'm Mike. I'm from NYC. That's all you need to know." The only other thing he shared with everyone was the fact that he was young onset Parkinson's diagnosis. So he was very young diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which is terrifying uh, to people who are young because it's most often thought of as a, as a, uh, a, 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 a Parkinson's is thought of something as, you know, an older person's uh, condition, potentially, not, not a younger person's condition. And so Mike was very, uh, you know, very, very private about his, his, who he was and what he was doing in real life. And, and he, 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 you know, he said, he came onto the chat room and he basically said, you know, I, I've just been diagnosed. I'm freaking out. I don't know anyone else who's dealing with young onset Parkinson's disease, let alone Parkinson's disease, period, and help me out here. And, and the community really came together and, and um, uh, uh, talked to him for, you know, Whenever he was online, and, 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 and over time, Mike actually then started giving back to the community. He started being there for other people because people would come into the chat room, and it was a similar thing. It's like, hi, I'm new to this environment. I was just diagnosed. Holy cow, I am freaking out. Help me. You know, what, what should I do? Uh, is this normal? Is this side effect of the drug normal? Um, uh, is it normal for me to feel this way? And, and he started really giving back to people. And, and about, a, about a year or two went by. And at, and at one point, Mike said, I'm ready to tell you guys who I really am. I just want to share it with you, just so you know. I just feel like I want to tell you who I am. And, and he said, I'm, um, <laughs> he said I'm, I'm Michael J. Fox. And, of course, everyone in the room said, you know, oh, yeah, sure. And I'm Robert Redford. And, yeah, and I'm, yeah, good joke, Mike. You're funny. 
you know, that's that's hilarious. And he said, no, I'm really Michael J. Fox, and and um, uh, I just wanted to thank you guys, and I just want to tell you that, you know, I'm inspired by all these early experiences, and I'm going to dedicate my life to, you know, building some kind of a foundation that I want to build to help do research in Parkinson's disease, and I want to just, you know, dedicate my life to giving back to finding a cure for this. And uh, no one believed him, of course. You know, yeah, okay, fine. And he said, no, really. He said, if anyone's in New York City, come to – he was filming – I can't remember the, the name of his show. He's like, I'm filming my show. Come to – you know, tell me your names here in, in private, one-to-one chat. Tell me your real-life name or, or don't. Just tell me the name you want to be known as, and I'll put you on the guest list, and I'll get you some seats up in the front when we're doing the filming you know, in, in, in New York for the show next week. And sure enough, you know, there were like a couple people who happened to be living in New York who were in this community and said, okay, we're going to show up just for fun. Yeah, okay. And, um, and they actually, it was him. They actually got to, to, to meet him. And, um, and so anyway, th- what was special about this in terms of stories is, is the power of, of um, uh, these environments that augment you by, uh, by augment everyone by giving you the ability to be uh, not anonymous but pseudo anonymous, right? To be able to share as much or as little as you want to, and it's different for everybody. But the power of that is, is um, um, I think, uh, a wonderful example told by this story. And his friendships, you know, he developed a lot of these people. You know, uh, he uh, the friendships lasted for many years after that. It's really, really amazing. Um, this story I want to mention about the, the faces. This was a. I started using a platform called The Palace. I don't know if anyone here remembers. This is you know, way back in the, the early 2000s, late 90s now. Um, the game called The Pal. It was a game, but you know, quotation marks game. It was a multi-user chat environment where you basically it was kind of like paper cutouts. You know, it was kind of not really 3D. It was really just 2D, but. Uh, um, people would log on, and, and the big thing was people loved to use uh, different faces, like your avatar. Most people would have it be these smiley faces, and they would change. The face would change. You can see there's a, th- a face picker down there. You would basically change your face to match your mood, and um, people were really, uh, really into that. And, and I found one group of people got really, really into that, and, and, uh, and, and this, people were saying, yeah, there's this group uh, – it's really taken off in the palace, John. You should check it out because again, people would use these technologies and spaces that I set up. You know, they would just do what they were going to do, and, and I would often find out about it after they were doing it, which is wonderful. You know, it was just to see these things evolve. And someone said, um, "Yeah, there's, there's this Mobius group." I don't. They're like, "What? what does, I'm like, "Mobius? What do you mean, Mobius?" And it turned out that um, the group that had really taken off in using this platform was uh, a group of people dealing with Mobius syndrome, which is a um, it's a neurological disorder that affects the cranial nerves, especially particularly the cranial nerves involved in um, moving your face. So people with Mobius syndrome in the physical world they can't smile, they can't really frown, they can't really uh, there's varying levels of it of course, but they can't. Um, it's a weakness and paralysis of facial muscles, and they, they can't express emotions on their faces in the physical world. And when they had discovered um, this uh, platform that gave you a lot of power over you know, being able to have a virtual face, they, uh, they just flocked to it and, and um, um, started adding all of their own custom emoticons and just taking off. And, and they were like, you know, hey, then I started getting pinged by them. and like, hey, John, can you expand the ability for us to do stuff with facial emoticons? And I'm like, oh, heck yeah, I'll tweak the technology to, to, to help you guys add more to them. And, um, you know, so they, you know, they, they, they had started out in using the chat rooms and then they had really taken off in the palace and, you know, with, with, the, the, with the ability for the palace to give them avatars with very malleable faces. It was, uh, it was just like uh, they just took flight. So um, an amazing story of, of, in this case, the augmentation is being able to smile or frown or kind of, you know, smirk. And uh, um, it was amazing to see augmentation like this uh, with the technology, improving people's quality of life uh, amazingly so. The last story I want to mention is um, I call it the safe, the safe and the scary. Uh, this is this is a picture of Second Life. This is Brigadoon Island, 
this was a um, an island that I set up before I was working at Linden Lab. I was using Second Life since well 2002. I was in beta, but in 2004, I had uh, started a space in Second Life called Brigadoon Island. Uh, it was actually uh, uh, an, uh, an outreach that I was trying to do in terms of exploring new technologies, and I created it as a space for people dealing with Asperger's syndrome to come and practice their socialization skills. I thought it might be really interesting uh, as a, a place for them to uh, practice the socializing in a 3D space because it's very difficult for people. You know, it's a spectrum disorder, autism spectrum disorder, but it's, a, it's there's a spectrum to it, and it's very difficult for many people dealing with Asperger's syndrome um, uh, to, to go into public places and interact with people in public places. And so I thought this would be kind of interesting. And so I set up this space and they, it just, it just took off for them. And what was amazing to me was that they, they create, they, they created always two very distinct types of places. They created places that were very um, uh, safe for them and they also deliberately created scary places in terms of challenging places for them you know i, I remember one one man created a a restaurant that was kind of a model of a restaurant in the physical world that like he had i, I think he had been to it a couple times but it was just he just couldn't deal with it it was just kind of terrifying experience for him but he he from memory recreated it in the environment here and and um was using it as a place to practice um uh, simulation is a place for him to practice being comfortable in it and, and, and meeting with other people in the space. And um, what was most special about it was uh, not just that it was, you know, they were, it was a wonderful example of, of um, people dealing with Asperger's syndrome and autism to, you know, practice and, 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 and engage in improving their quality of life by learning to gain confidence. And they, there was a very positive correlation there. They were people, you know, who were reporting back and saying, I have gained confidence in the physical world due to my practicing in these simulations that I've worked on, um, in, uh, in Brigadoon Island. And again, they were, these were being built by them. I didn't build any of them. I basically said, here are the tools. You can build your own spaces and build spaces for other people in the community. And, and, um, uh, but what was most special about this, too, was the fact that one of the people involved was um, the Sojourner, who um, got very inspired to go on and help build more communities that evolved into things like uh, like virtual ability, right? So um, it wasn't just a one-off thing. It was um, something that took on and has, has a life of its own uh, uh, today. So really, you know, what are the... What are the lessons from these stories around augmentation and education and you know and uh, the artistic expression as well? I think um, one is that I think there's real magic that happens in any kind of multi-user and malleable environment, and you know it can be a space like Second Life where you can co-create whatever you want to create, and it's full of people, but it can also be in you know. Uh, uh, just text-based chat rooms. It can be in, you know, weird little things like the palace, which is like playing with electronic paper dolls on a flat picture, you know. Um, and that's because point number two is that, you know, people will squeeze amazing emotional bandwidth out of whatever they can get their hands on. Um, you know, you, you just have to get people together and get them using the tools that give them some malleability, some control over, over uh, shaping not about you know, it's about shaping a place you know and that, and that could be you know creating customized content in the space or whatever but it, they squeeze amazing emotional bandwidth out of this and so you have conversations that happen that are not just dry sharing of textual information it's just it's it's an amazing sharing of emotional support and that is a really very powerful thing you know when, when you're talking about going beyond escapism it's like these are environments where people laugh and cry and have the full emotional range of experiences shared between them that that also happen in the physical world and and i think the other other lesson that's really amazing is that you know people will use these tools to create not just comforting things but challenging things I see this all the time uh, I, like I was describing with, with Brigadoon but people um, people have opportunities not just to create fun little places that are kind of comforting but you see people creating things that are challenging you know challenging to create challenging to experience you know people people uh, like to 
use these environments to um, to improve their quality of life by helping them face their fears. You know, what's the what's the saying? The you know, inside the cave that is most scary to you is where the most important treasure is, right? You know, so it's a, so people these are opportunities to 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 face um, people to to uh, to face you know to face their fears, to face uh, things that are challenging to them. And another lesson that was very powerful, I think, is um, again this idea of encouraging masks and discouraging visibility. Uh, you know, when people have the ability to control how much they share about their own you know their real life identity or whatever. Um, uh, it's just I, I see it continually as a very very positive thing. Um, and masks aren't just about hiding. Masks are about highlighting certain aspects of your personality, right? About bringing to the surface a facet of yourself that you want to really share with other people. You know, a mask again is a mask isn't just about what it covers up. It's but it's about what it highlights, what it brings to the surface. And um, you know, when in these virtual environments, these virtual worlds, uh, when people talk about about um, uh, about you know wearing avatars and like oh it's totally different from me in the physical world and uh, you know it's a very powerful force for good in my experience. Um, what you do want to discourage though is invisibility. You want to discourage you know people being completely um, uh, and, and maybe anonymity is not their best term, but I guess what I'm trying to say is you know people not being no persistence to their identity. I mean, you, you could be totally anonymous, but as long as you're the same anonymous person, like your anonymous person, you know, number 513, and as long as there's a consistency to you, then you can avoid, you know, you can avoid, you know, um, the more negative aspects of, of, you know, people who just want to cause trouble and keep hiding themselves behind multiple identities. So whatever it can be done to discourage complete invisibility and no, um, uh, Persistence to identity. I think that's a that's a good thing to do. But probably the most um, important thing in my experience, when you're luck- looking at virtual worlds and helping them grow to beyond escapism, beyond just entertainment, but into you know really helping people, especially helping people improve their quality of life and helping people learn, is um, to to build tools and cultivate not just the communities within these spaces, but cultivate um, their ability and dreams to to build new communities. Because, like uh, what happened with with Sojourner and and um, you know the people involved in virtual ability, and you know, there's this um, when you when things happen right, then the people in these communities will go on to build more communities. And I think it's the um, responsibility of uh, the caretakers of the environments that these people are working in to not just help these communities that exist now and grow now uh, to be successful, but to um, um, encourage them with you know, tools and support to be able to um, build new communities beyond what exists today, because the, the communities of tomorrow are really where, you know, it's the future where everyone will live. <laughs> so... Um, that's, I think, a, a very important thing to do. So that's um, that's my talk. Holy cow! Look at that. I'm on time. Seven, it's, you know, seven fifty here. My time. Um, again, thinking about that beyond escapism. Think about these these three areas. Um, you know, this intersection between art, education, and you know, augmentation. You know, uh, think about examples. That you can find, um, you know, in Second Life and in other virtual worlds, and I think um, uh, think of the lessons learned then from these these amazing uh, examples of uh, the magic that happens at these intersections. So that's it. Thank it's you, thank you so much, John. I hope that everybody can hear me now. <laughs> um, hopefully. Uh, we did start a little bit late, so we can probably take a couple of questions for John. If anybody uh, wants to say them in chat, oh, good, we can hear me. <laughs> um, I can go ahead and grab them if that's okay. Just about five more minutes. So if anybody has questions for John for Pathfinder, post them on chat, and I'll try to kind of moderate them as best I can for him. Cool. Thank you.
Oh, and I'll put in chat my slides, too, so people can just go there if they want to get them. Oh, thank you, John. Yeah, I know that's usually one of the first questions we get. Will the slides be available somewhere? <laughs> they already are. Awesome. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right. There's the, there's the link. That, that link should work. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so oh, wow, we have, Jens, uh, thank you. You stayed up till 2 a.m.? <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. boy. Well, we have some good comments from the audience. Uh, thank you so much, Pat. This was wonderful to hear about because I'm seeing the same sorts of stories of people who use VWs to connect them back um, and support each other and he yeah, and then somebody else mentions nurses, and I knew a nurse that worked with people coming out of comas. He used SL to help integrate them back. Oh, we have a question. Here we go, Buffy. There were so many businesses involved in SL years ago. Do you think they'll ever be enticed to come back to this or any other virtual world? Um, that's a good question. I mean, well, you know, what's happening now is, you know, everyone's bananas about VR and uh We'll <laughs> we'll see how that turns out in terms of broad adoption. I think there's, you know, there's amazing, powerful niches for for VR. But in general, with so many businesses, and, um, I you know I see, I see them coming back when they see very clear return on investment, because that's at the end of the day what businesses are all about. Gone are the because a, a lot of the early stuff were basic was by, was marketing. It was basically businesses wanted to be known to be involved in. Things like Second Life, because Second Life was on the cover of, of, of Business Week magazine with Anchi Chung, you know, as an avatar on there. And it was really the early interest around businesses in Second Life was purely marketing. You know, they may, give, they may have given, I'll be honest, they may have given lip service about, yeah, we're going to use this platform for, 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 for you know, uh, employee education and outreach to avatars. And at the, at the end of the day, they were just interested in surfing the press tidal wave of anything that mentioned Second Life. I mean, all you had to do is go to any, you know, journalist anywhere and say, like, I'm doing something, 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 Second Life. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, great. We're going to write about you. And, and that's free press. And that's free marketing. And companies' ears perk up at stuff like that. So I think the challenge will be, you know, they're never going to come back for marketing purposes anymore because the, you know, well, that's, I mean, that's why a lot of them are jumping into VR, to be honest, too. They're jumping into VR not because they feel it's actually honestly going to – be a positive return on any kind of investment in learning, but they re rather see it as a positive return on marketing, you know, because they'll get mentioned in the news. So I think, um, I think what will have to be shown is just very clear, you know, how, what's the, how is this improving their bottom line? You know, I think, I think it's more of, I think virtual worlds are becoming, oh yeah, Dragon says something very powerful there too. It's, you know, there's a driving force for social enterprises and nonprofits and fundraising. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think the real power for, for virtual worlds is like the slide that's still on the screen behind me. You know, it's this intersection between art education and augmentation. And augmentation is where all of the social, um, you know, working with people with disabilities, the, the social outreach and so forth um, happens in that space too. So, Thank you so much, John. That was that was really inspiring. I, I enjoyed your story so much, and it seems like everybody in the audience enjoyed them as well. A lot of accolades. Uh, we very much appreciate that you joined us for our 10th anniversary for our legacy year. Um, it, it made it very, very memorable and special, special for all of us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, John. Uh, and hopefully you'll stay around for our closing. We're almost closing 10th anniversary VWBP. Thank you all. Nice. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to res all my friends on stage here now. Oh, are they falling in the water? Oh, no. I don't want them to fall in the water here. There you go. Hey, guys. Let's pack the stage. How many can I fit here? Let's see. <laughs> Some of them are falling in the water. They're temp res. They should go away eventually. Party time. Keep coming. I won't go overboard, Helena. I won't. I won't. Uh, 
Won't risk a thousand of them. I'm just doing it manually here. Hey guys. Ooh. Send them amongst the audience. Well, I think they they follow me. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Let me take, detach my HUD here. There, they're, they're following me. I don't think they'll. Whoa, guys, they're crowding me. Will they fly? No, they don't fly. Oh, why? Look at this. This is not. This is not good. Oh boy. All right, I want to crash. I don't want to crash things for people, so I'm going to send them home. Ready? Three, two, one. Go home. Goodbye. Fly, fly away. <laughs> there we go.